Spanish, the cases of prodigious memory catalogued in the Naturalis Historia. Cyrus, the king of Persia, who could call the soldiers in his armies by name. Mithridates Iopator, who meted out justice at twenty-two languages of the kingdom over which he ruled. Simonides, the inventor of the art of memory. Metrodorus, who was able faithfully to repeat what he had heard, though it be but once. With obvious sincerity, Erroneo said he was amazed that such cases were thought to be amazing. He told me that before that rainy afternoon when the blue roan had bucked him off, he had been what every man was, blind, deaf, befuddled, and virtually devoid of memory. I tried to remind him how precise his perception of time, his memory for proper names, had been. He ignored me. He had lived, he said, for nineteen years as though in a dream. He looked without seeing, heard without listening, forgot everything, or virtually everything. When he fell, he'd been knocked unconscious. When he came to again, the present was so rich, so clear, that it was almost unbearable, as were his oldest and even his most trivial memories. It was shortly afterward that he learned he was crippled. Of that fact, he hardly took notice. He reasoned, or felt, that amiability was a small price to pay. Now his perception and his memory were perfect. With one quick look, you and I perceived three wine glasses on a table. Funes perceived every grape that had been pressed into the wine and all the stalks and tendrils of its vineyard. He knew the forms of the clouds in the southern sky on the morning of April 30th, 1882, and he could compare them in his memory with the veins of the marbled binding of a book he had seen only once, or with the feathers of spray lifted by an oar on the Rio Negro on the, be on the eve of the Battle of Quebracho. Nor were these memories simple. Every visual image was linked to muscular sensations thermal sensations, and so on. He was able to reconstruct every dream, every daydream he had ever had. Two or three times he had reconstructed an entire day. He had never once erred or faltered. But each reconstructed a he constru reconstruction had itself taken an entire day. I, myself, alone, more memories than all of mankind since the world began, he said to me. And also, my dreams are like other people's waking hours. And again, toward dawn, my memory, sir, is like a garbage heap. A circle drawn on a blackboard, a right triangle, a rhombus, all these are forms we can easily intuit. Erroneo could do the same with the stormy mane of a young colt, a small herd of cattle on a mountainside, a flickering fire in its uncountable ashes, and the many faces of a dead man at a wake. I have no idea how many stars he saw in the sky. Those are the things he told me. Neither then nor later have I ever doubted them. At that time, there were no cinematographers, no phonographs. It nevertheless strikes me as implausible, even incredible, that no one ever performed an experiment with Funes. But then, all our lives we postpone everything that can be postponed. Perhaps we all have the certainty, deep inside, that we are immortal, and sooner or later every man will do everything, know all there is to know. voice of Funes from the darkness went on talking. He told me that in 1886 he had invented a numbering system original with himself, and that within a very few days he had passed the 24,000 mark. He had not written it down, since anything he thought, even once, remained erotically with him. His original motivation, I think, was as that the thirty-three Uruguayan patriots should require two figures and three words rather than a single figure, a single word. He then applied this bad principle to the other numbers. Instead of seven thousand to thirteen, seven zero one to three, he would say, for instance, Maximo Perez. Instead of seven thousand fourteen, seven zero one. 
electricity in Deveria. Instead of 500, 500, he said 9. Every word had a particular figure attached to it, a sort of marker. The later ones were extremely complicated. I tried to explain to Funes that his rhapsody of unconnected words was exactly the opposite of a number system. I told him that what one said, 365, one said, three hundreds, six tens, and five ones, a breakdown impossible with the numbers, Nigger Timoteo, or a poncho full of meat. Phineas either could not or would not understand me. In the seventeenth century, Locke postulated and condemned possible language in which each individual thing, every stone, every bird, every branch, would have its own name. Phineas once contemplated a similar language, but discarded the idea as too general, too ambiguous. The truth was, Phineas remembered not only every leaf of every tree and every patch of forest, but every time he had perceived or imagined that leaf. He resolved to reduce every one of his past days to some seventy thousand recollections, which he would then define by numbers. Two considerations dissuaded him, the realization that the task was interminable, and the realization that it was pointless. He saw by the, that by the time he died he would still not have finished classifying all the memories of his childhood. Objects I have mentioned, an infinite vocabulary for the natural series of numbers, and a pointless mental catalogue of all the images of his memory, are foolish, even preposterous, but they reveal a certain halting grandeur. They allow us to glimpse, or to infer, the dizzying world that Funes lived in. Funes, we must not forget, was virtually incapable general platonic ideas. Not only was it, for, was it difficult for him to see that the generic symbol, dog, took in all the dissimilar individuals of all shapes and sizes, it irritated him that the dog of 3.14 in the afternoon, seen in profile, should be indicated by the same noun as the dog of 3.15, seen frontally. His own face in the mirror his own hands surprised him every time he saw them. Swift wrote that the Emperor of Lilliput could perceive the movement of the minute hand of a clock. Funes could continually perceive the quiet advances of corruption, of tooth decay, of weariness. He saw, he noticed, the progress of death, of humidity, he was the solitary, lucid spectator of a multi-form, momentaneous, and almost unbearably precise world. Babylon, London, and New York dazzled mankind's imagination with their fierce splendor. No one in the populous towers or urgent avenues of those cities has ever felt the heat and pressure of a reality as inexhaustible as that which battered Erodio day and night his poor South American hinterland. It was hard for him to sleep. To sleep is to take one's mind from the world, Fenez lying on his back on his cot, in the dimness of his room, could picture every crack in the wall, every molding of the precise houses that surrounded him. I repeat that the most trivial of his memories was more detailed, more vivid than our own perception of a physical pleasure or a physical torment. Off toward the east, in an area that had not been yet cut up into city blocks, there were new houses, unfamiliar to Aronio. He pictured them to himself as black, compact, made of homogeneous shadow. He would turn his head in that direction to sleep. He would also imagine himself at the bottom of a river, rocked and negated by the current. He had effortlessly learned English, French, Portuguese.
was 19. He had been born in 1868. He looked to me as monumental as bronze, older than Egypt, older than the prophecies of the pyramids. I was struck by the thought that every word I spoke, every expression of my face, 